What's up everyone? Welcome to MTX Chess. My name is Nathan. Thanks for watching this video. Please like and subscribe. New videos come in every week. Today, I'm so excited to take us through a Grandmaster game between Rashid Nezmedinov and Lev Poligevsky. These guys were both Soviet Grandmasters and this game was played in 1958. This game is a fantastic example of brutal and persistent attacking in the middle game by Nezmedinov, who's playing black. So let's just get into it. So again, Poligevsky has the white pieces and Nezmedinov has the black pieces. White starts with d4, knight f6, c4, d6, knight c3, e5, and then e4. If we just go back and move here, you may be wondering why didn't white take d takes e5, black would respond taking on e5, and then queen, queen takes d8, king takes d8. Here we find ourselves in an end game where black has lost the ability to castle and their king seems a little dis a little bit displaced. You may think that white is better on this position, but after a move like c6, controlling these important squares for the knight, the king kind of tucks itself away to c7 and the black king's pretty safe. So this end game really isn't that ad advantageous for white. And so that's why instead of playing d takes e5, white simply played e4 in this scenario, in this position. Nesmanidov continue with e takes d4, queen takes d4, knight c6. For white, you know, where does the queen go in this situation? Black seems like they just developed a piece with the tempo. So the queen could come all the way back to d1, and it would seem kind of wasted. So what Paul Gavsky decided to do was go queen d2. This may seem like a weird move because it blocks in the bishop, but we'll see here in a second kind of where the bishop's going to end up. Black plays g6, white plays b3, bishop g7, bishop b2, castle kingside for black, bishop d3 for white. And now black play here plays probably his first of what's going to be a number of shocking moves, knight g4. So it's kind of strange, you know, Nezmedinov has the rook undeveloped, he has the bishop undeveloped, he has the queen undeveloped, and yet he moves his knight the second time. What's the idea here with this knight? Well, in thinking of trying to find a good square for this c8 bishop, it behooves us to think of this f5 square being a great square, but the only way to get control of this f5 square is by pushing f f7 to f5. So I think the, the whole reason kind of behind this move was really um, to, to push f5, maybe get a pawn trade, take with the bishop. If the bishop exchanges, then white blacks, um, the black rook comes alive and puts a lot of pressure on this f2 square. That's kind of, I, I think that's kind of what black was thinking here. White continues with their development, knight e2. And now black plays queen h4, another shocking move, already already attacking here on f2. And obviously if, if white were to castle, black would uh, checkmate on h2 with queen takes h2. White stops all that though with knight g3. And now black plays another kind of interesting move. They play a retreating move. They play knight g e4, or g e5, excuse me. So this is kind of an interesting move. Um, most players, instead of taking this knight kind of out of the attack might play something like uh, knight c to e5. So as opposed to the knight on uh, the g file coming to e5, the knight on the c file would go to e5. This looks good, but after white plays something like bishop c2, and white could play f5, e takes, let's say black were to take back, g takes, a move like f4. Now the attack on white's king side is kind of stymied. Black, or excuse me, white can castle queen side and totally change the whole nature of the game. And white also has this really nice d5 square for their knight, threatening the c7, c, weak c7 pawn. So moving knight c to e5, even though it looks like the more active move, really leads to a position that's a lot more favorable for white. So if we go back. So that's why Nesmondinov played knight g to e5. White castles kingside, and black continues with their original plan of playing f5. So in this position, what, what black's threatening to do here is just march this pawn down towards the king. Pawn f4 is going to kick the knight off the square, and then pawn f3 is going to really weaken the g2 square, and white is going to be in a lot of trouble. So how do you stop this as white? One move that you might play is like pawn f4, but this doesn't work either. After knight g4, black is now threatening checkmate on h2. White has to respond with h3. Queen takes g3. White may think they've won the knight back, but can you spot a little uh, checkmate tactic here for white? Yeah, so bishop d4 check, king h1. This bishop takes away this g1 square. 
and queen h4 checkmate. So already here on move 16, we've got kind of mating, uh, little mating webs and mating tactics possibly in play. So white can't play the move pawn f4. So instead, white plays f f3, and this really shores up the position. Yeah, if f4 gets played, the, the white knight will have to retreat, but white doesn't have to worry about any funny business with the pawn getting all the way down to f3. In this position, black played bishop h6, white retreats to d1. And now in this position, what would you do as black? So anytime you consider what type of moves to make, you always gotta look at the checks. So obviously, bishop e3 check, and the king would be coming over to h1. And the king would be on this same file as the queen. But black did not play bishop e3. Instead, black played f4. But let's go back. Why didn't black play bishop e3? Well, let's take a look at it. After king h1, black could play f4, shoring up this bishop on this e3 square, really anchoring it there. White would have to push their knight back that's attacked by the pawn, knight g, knight, uh, g to e2. And then who knows what black would do in this situation, but basically what white is threatening is something like d5, knight d5, with a fork on c7 and e3. So this bishop would end up falling, and then to take back, black would end up with this really weak pawn on e3. Nezmedinov obviously wanted to avoid all of that. So after queen d1, instead of playing a knight, uh, bishop e3 check, black simply played f4. White retreats knight g to e2, and Nezmendinov here, in just classic Nezmendinov fashion, just continues marching forward. g5, white gets their knight out to a great outpost square, d5, with threats coming to the c7 square. Doesn't matter for black, black's going to play g4. And now, um, you may be thinking as white, oh, man, black's just pushing their pawn, why don't I just take here on c7? Well, let's see what happens. If knight takes c7, Black's just going to play g3, just keep pushing that pawn down white's throat. After h3, bishop takes h3, um, and if the knight takes on takes the rook out here, you'll get bishop uh, bishop takes g2, and the queen's coming to h2 checkmate, the queen's coming to h1 checkmate, and so it doesn't really matter that, that white was able to pick off this rook, they're getting, checkmate, they're getting mated. So knight takes c7's on an option. So in this position, what white ended up playing is g3. Black responded with f takes g3, white h takes g3, and now queen h3. And then white plays f4. So um, the knight is obviously under attack for black. So if you're if you're a kind of a lesser player than Nezmedinov, uh, which you, there's no nothing wrong with being that, Nezmedinov was one of the greats you might be tempted to move this knight really into the attack. And so a move like knight f3 might be something that you consider. The problem with knight f3 check is after king f2, queen h2 check, king e3, the king's kind of escaping to the middle of the board here. And if this knight gets traded off, the king's going to be able to go to d2 and then to c1, and basically the king has escaped the attack. Controlling the direction the king goes in the middle game is so important to, to, to a good, successful attack. So here what black did is they played bishop e6. This is a tough move to find, but basically black is trying to get more pieces involved in the attack. Getting uh, Moving the bishop allows this rook on a8 to eventually come in if they need to, and it also mobilizes this bishop. Alrighty. Um, white here played plays bishop c2. And then, or and let's, let's say, if we just go back to this position real quick, so why didn't uh, white take on c7? Because now what we've got white here has got a fork between the rook and the bishop. Well, after this, we get something like bishop takes f4. And if g takes f4, then what white's just going to do is they're just going to push g3. They'll just push g3, and they're threatening um, queen h2 checkmate on the next move. Okay? And if instead of the pawn taking... Excuse me. So if if you take here and the rook takes, then the rook would simply take. And if the pawn takes again, then we'd be pushing g3. Right? So it doesn't really matter how white takes here. Even if they take with the knight, uh, and if they if they do take with the knight right away, well the pawn's hanging, so we just take the pawn. Um and uh and we'd be we'd be winning here. A black would be winning here. 
So even though bishop e3 makes it seem like there's a fork, that fork's not really available to the bishop e6 makes it seem like there's a that white can fork here on c7. That fork doesn't really work for white. So why did them do, end up doing is playing bishop c2? Black played this great rook f7. The idea being black's going to double up their rooks on the f file and really kind of blow through this defense here. So that's a problem. And then also, you know, with this, um, one thing you may have considered if you were black here would be trading, trading this bishop for this great knight. But after queen takes, the king's got to move, the queen takes with check. But once we um, get to this position where the rook, the rook comes up, now the bishop trade can happen. If the bishop takes here, then the queen takes. What we have is knight b4, and we're going to be forking the queen and the bishop. So black's got some counterplay. And because this queen take doesn't come with a tempo on the king, black has an opportunity to, to fork there. So it was at this point in the game that Paul Gavsky just decided to get out of dodge, and he played king f2. He's like, let's run, basically. Black played queen h2 check. King e3. Bishop takes d5, just getting rid of that, that really good knight defender. C takes d5. Knight b4. And in this position right here, this pawn is pinned, so this pawn cannot take the knight. This pawn can't be pushed. And this queen is in a great position. And so white played the really natural rook h1. So this is a huge impasse in this game, right? So this queen is is skewered to this bishop. So if the queen moves to a safe square, like if we moved queen g2, the rook would simply take the bishop and our attack really fizzles out. This bishop is a super important part of the attack because this bishop's pinning the pawn to the king and putting pressure on the king at the same time. So what did Nesmanidov play in this position? Nesmanidov played the fantastic rook takes f4. So let's think about it. If the knight takes on f4, queen g3 check, and white just gave up a rook, they picked up two pawns, and they're going to be picking up this knight. So that doesn't really work, right? And then if after uh, rook takes f4, white responds with g takes f4, we simply get bishop takes f4, knight takes f4, knight, and then we get the, this really great knight takes c2. So the king now is trapped. The knight's covering these squares, and the queen is obviously co covering these three squares, and this knight is delivering check. So the only option white has is to take the knight, at which point black will take the white queen. So black becomes is, ends up being up a queen. So obviously after this, this really great rook, ta uh, rook takes f4, white can't capture without something bad happening. So white simply plays rook takes h2, trying to pick up the queen. So what does black do in this situation? Right now, this rook is hanging and this bishop is hanging. Well, anytime you've got two pieces under attack, the best way to get yourself out of that situation is to do a double check. So black plays rook f3 check. White plays king d4. And now another great move by Nesmondinov, a kind of a quiet move, bishop g7. This bishop, after the king moves off that diagonal, isn't really doing much on this h6 square. Moving to the g7 square, where we, again, have all of these really great discover checks, double check options, makes makes for just a really exciting game. So in this position, obviously, um, white is, uh, you know, thinking of something like, or I'm sorry, black is thinking of something like pawn b5, which would take away this, this c4 square, and then, a move, and then moving the knight out of the way so that the bishop would check, and that would be checkmate. So... What white decided to do in this position was play a4 to take away this, this pawn from coming to b5. You may be wondering, okay, the other thing that's restricting the king is this rook. So why doesn't white kind of attack this rook? What if white could put some pressure on this rook? And we'll get into a little bit of a really interesting line. I just love this line. The way it ends is just fantastic. So if white wanted to put pressure on this rook to try and maybe kick this rook off of this square so that the, the white king would kind of um, get out of the, the little trap that, that black is setting for it, white might play something like rook d1. Black would uh, take the pawn. The knight might come back to e2, just putting pressure on the rook. Rook f3, rook back, uh, or I'm sorry, knight back to g1. And then we get this really great knight uh, ed3 check, right, checking with the bishop. 
if white blocks with e5, um, then bishop takes, uh, king here, and then knight c5 checkmate. That's a, isn't, that, isn't that a pretty little checkmate? That's pretty nice. If instead of blocking with the pawn, right, so we were at, uh, whereas before the, when the king was back here, the pawn blocked, the king moves to c4. Now we do knight b2. If the king comes here, we could take the queen as black, but we've got a little mating net going on, so what we'll do is we'll play bishop c3 check. If the king comes to b5, we're just going to push a6, and it'll be checkmate. So the king's forced in this little corner here. So how do you checkmate the king in this position? Well, black thinks of playing b5 with eventual b4, right? And then there's really only one way to stop it. You, uh, you, black, white plays b4 themselves. And then a5. White has no choice but to take the rook. And after check, king over. Oh, that's not the move we wanted. Rook a3 checkmate. Isn't that a fantastic checkmate? I just love that. The, the white king gets all smothered. So obviously the players saw this. And so that's why white, instead of trying to uh, attack the attack the rook, really spent uh, spent time trying to stop b5 from happening by playing a4. So that's why white played this a4 move. All right, if we move on, um, black plays this this pawn c5 check, and it would be checkmate if it wasn't for this pawn. And so uh, white takes en passant, we take back, and now black is threatening checkmate again. And so how does white stop this checkmate now? Well, it's got to play bishop d3. They've got to create a scape square for their king. Knight takes um, on uh, d3. The king is forced to c4. And after pawn d5, pawn takes d5, pawn takes d5, the king's coming to b5, rook b8, king a5, and then can you see checkmate from here? Black plays knight c6, and it was in this position that uh, that Polagetsky resigned the game. But the way the game would continue is if black played uh, king a6, and then uh, or white played king a6, and then black would have the option of checkmating either on c5 or b4. I, I, I would do c5. I just think aesthetically that's just a nice checkmate right there. So yeah, a fantastic game by Nesmondinov. Uh, really just so many uh, tactical brilliancies there. And he was down a queen the entire game. And you never, you never got the sense that he was down a lot of material because the attack was just so pristine. So really, really a masterpiece from, uh, from Nesmondinov. These two guys played, uh, played a lot and actually Paul Gesky won the vast majority of the games they played uh, but this one game that Nesmondinov won was just such a uh, just a masterful tactical display that no one remembers all the other games that Paul Gesky won against Nesmondinov so sometimes it pays to be tactical so yeah I hope you enjoyed this video please like and subscribe new videos come in every week um, please leave a comment uh, and then feel free to hit me up on MTX official on chess.com I love to play some of you and um, until next time, thanks.